I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done I don't want them nukes run by them kooks Who think radioactivity is fun No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done No news! Toledo and a very good afternoon Columbus and a very big hello to those of you listening from elsewhere. My name is Shehbaz Khan and I'm your guest host for this week on For a Green Future. As we mentioned last week, Jody Mayer, our regular host, is running for mayor of Bowling Green. Cumulus Broadcasting interprets the equal time law to say that he can't actually host the show while campaigning. So I'm very happy and glad to be part of this show and host the show along with our regular superb co-host, Rebecca Wood. Thank you. So we are back in the studio today and live. If you have any questions or comments, especially those fishing for walleye on Maumee River, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to call us at, call us at anytime on 877-909-1007. For a green future, this show is all about ecology and the environment and the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, and the wealth, health, and happiness of your friends, families, and your pets. Even the fish swimming in the Maumee River and all the insects that are finally up and flying around again now that it's all warmed up and all the flowers that are blooming and everybody and everything because like it or not we are all wrapped up on this tiny little planet called earth and we are all in this together so we have an excellent show for you this week for the next 10 minutes or so we will be just chatting and i'd like to tell you a little bit more about myself so that you can get to know about me a little bit more uh, then as you may know it's walleye season and the maumi is full of people fishing so first we we will have a recording of the official 2023 fishing forecast from the ohio department of natural resources then we actually went down to the maumi and did a short but excellent interview with monica lewis uh, we found her following her passion fishing on the river along with her friends. After those recordings, we will hear from our fantastic patrons and sponsors. They are the people and businesses with the foresight to support for a green future. In order to actually happen the green future, uh, then we will hear from Rebecca. Rebecca, what will you be talking to us about this week? Food deserts. Wow, that's great. Uh, finally, we have updates on it's, news from... It's not great, but you know... <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, the it's topic, good to be aware of. <laughs> the, the topic is great because I think it's a very sensitive topic because as we see uh, the ecological patterns changing and everything is changing, uh, I think it is very important because uh, food is becoming a very big issue globally. And as we know, the breadbasket of the world, Ukraine, is already into trouble. 
So I think your insight will be really helpful. Really doesn't we, we don't need a dose of radiation there on top of everything else for starters. <laughs> that is that is so true. That yeah. is true too. And the, and that threat is continuously looming. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, we will also have updates on ecological news uh, from around the world. Uh, basically, that will be our show. Uh, we hope you all stick with us for the whole thing. Uh, you won't be sorry. Indeed. <laughs> now, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about myself, uh, uh, how I grew up on the farm. Uh, le let me begin with my uh, uh, academic profile first. I learned media production, uh, media communications and production in uh, University of Toledo. And I'm, I'm learning media studies in the Bowling Green State University for my master's program. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad uh, for this opportunity to be part of such a great movement uh, and such a great show. Uh, I, a shout out especially to uh, our uh, future mayor, uh, Jody Mayer. Yes. <laughs> for giving me this opportunity to host in his place. We knew uh, him when. Yeah. <laughs> Way back when. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me begin with my, my uh, story. Uh, I'm basically from India uh, uh, and I, I come from a state called Maharashtra. It, the Maharashtra has a shoreline uh, uh, basically on the west coast which is uh, you know facing to the Arabian Sea. Uh, when we when we talk about Maharashtra, it's it's a uh, financial uh, uh, state. It has lots of uh, advancements in technology, academia, business. It has historical importance, and the most famous thing is uh, Bollywood, Mumbai. So just like uh, in the United States, when we talk about LA, what comes to mind is Hollywood. So when we talk about Mumbai, what comes to mind is Bollywood. Uh, and they know how to put on a show. I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, everybody <A> loves <laughs> the Bollywood uh, dance and music, of course. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it will be. Uh, it's not that they are totally. Uh, the, uh, the state is only about uh, art and and finance, but it also has great industries, uh, leading world brands, and it's also. A, uh, economic hub. I grew up in a very small uh, uh, village. Uh, uh, now it has grown into a town, a pretty big town now, uh, somewhat around uh, 400 some kilometers from Mumbai. That will be roughly around uh, 300 some miles. Uh, since our, our theme of this week is water, and water conservation, how important it is. I would like to uh, center my uh, story and my experiences uh, around water and how water, I have, I have experienced water change, the lives of people in, in the village where I grew up. So uh, this small village called Nandura, it was, it was a small village with a flowing river, a small river, and it had a very small forest and good wooded area. There were lots of flora and fauna. Uh, the thing is that uh, the animals on the farms, they, and we had lots of animals on the farms. We had buffaloes and sheep and goats and also bullock carts and donkeys, donkeys to carry the load for donkey carts. So uh, it was it was uh, very nice. Uh, and I have not personally experienced it, but all these things, when I listen from my elders, my relatives who have actually seen this firsthand, uh, it, it feels so fascinating. But when I visit, when I uh, talk about my town now, my village now, it has completely transformed. Uh, although it has modernized, uh, it has developed, it has you know evolved into uh, a higher society, as we can say. But uh, at what cost? The the uh, water levels depleted due to the deforestation and cutting down of the trees. Uh, the, the, the animals got affected because of that, the domesticated animals as well as the, the wild animals in the woods and forest. Uh, they were directly impacted because, you know, the, the pasteurizing lands and the water flowing, they, it, it, it 
slow and steady, all these natural resources started depleting and they were having adverse effect, not only on the animals and the farms, but also the farmers, the farmers were struggling, uh, uh, not only on their farms, but also in their houses, because it was impacting their daily routine, their, their daily lives. Uh, so the depleting water, uh, deforestation, uh, uh, loss of uh, uh, animals, uh, you know, domesticated animals. Uh, so loss of livestock, to be to be to be more precise. Mm -hmm. So that those things really impacted, and you know, uh, that kind of drew me closer when I hear more about that. Uh, such such cases how important ecology and eco, uh, ecosystem is how important our, our climate is apart from that uh, what what really interesting is when i when i grew up and i started working with with uh, advertising media and i started working for a firm uh, an organization that uh, uh, dealt with agriculture based products so they used to buy per agriculture based products fresh and and uh, dry like dry means like maize wheat and all those and fresh like fruits and all fruits and uh, leafy vegetables so wait, wait, maize and wheat these are not traditional indian crops right you i assume you're uh growing them for export or maybe they've become more people in India eat this stuff now? Uh, uh, India is a very big exporter of uh, uh, wheat yeah. and uh, <laughs> corn. Yeah, there you wheat go. And corn. They, they're, they're a big exporter. So, uh, but the thing is that building up dams and the depleting of uh, rivers, building up of industries, I'm not against industries as such, but this industrialization modernization at what cost we need to be very careful about that as well we need to consider that as well because uh, as we can see you know i hear it, uh, the the good green stories about my village from my elders and i tell the good green stories to my younger generation but they won't be able to tell these green stories to their kids their generation so what we are doing is we are on the behest of industrialization and modernization and advancement we are robbing our younger generation of all the you know the the ecology the survival of this planet so i think we are putting our younger generation into trouble in in a, in a sense that they're just going to sit there and hear your story be like mom grandpa's talking crazy stuff about forests you know that had Dragons and unicorns in them again. Yeah. <laughs> he just makes this stuff so, up. You yeah, know? <laughs> <laughs> that is that is so true. I mean, they they won't be. I mean, it will be all in in just you know books like like fairy tales. You know, they won't and they won't be able to experience it firsthand. You know, uh, so that that is that really concerns me. So I and, and since our our theme is based on water, I think water is. You know, as many of the big businessmen has often come out and say that future wars wars will be fought over water, as the the food products are depleting, the resources are depleting. So is uh, freshwater resources. Uh, one of the biggest freshwater resources planet Earth has is uh, are the glaciers, and we we see slow and gradually the the melting of ice caps and ice i mean not so it's, gradual yeah. anymore some of them are just gone now yeah i mean <laughs> kind of horrifying so, so the, the the natural resources for our freshwater resources they are also depleting and they are going to affect the ecology the the rain and everything so so eventually i mean we are going to get into trouble if we don't wake up so keep listening to for a green future and stay tuned with all the ecological uh, updates so growing up on farm one thing i really wanted to appreciate uh, was uh, the importance of water water is uh, water literally is life and we here in northwest ohio are blessed with the kind of abundance of water resource we have here uh, i really admire that where there's water there are fish so now we will listen to the ohio department of natural resources official fish forecast for the year 2023 in the first part of this recording uh, travis hartman 
Uh, he is the manager for Lake Erie Fisheries Program. Uh, he is describing state uh, Castalia fishery fish hatchery. Uh, then he gives the official fishery forecast. Forecast. So here it comes. So it, it's hard to see them, but you can see the fish flipping around. These are actually all small steelhead trout. Uh, they, we get eggs in April, and then as those eggs hatch out, we have them in the, a building next door here. They, they hatch, and, and we grow them as much as we can in that hatchery building, then they come into this raceway. And for about half the year, they're in this raceway being fed and, and growing to hit a target range of seven to nine inches when we stock them into the streams in April. They think they're getting fed soon. <laughs> so what we've learned over the years is this hatchery is well suited to raising 450,000 steelhead trout. With our annual cycle, we acquire eggs, we hatch them out. For a full year, we're growing these trout up to the right size to stock into Lake Erie. Every April, we, we harvest all these trout out of the runways and we stock 450,000 into a total of six streams on Ohio's shoreline of Lake Erie. The steelhead trout are a, a really, not just regional, but national uh, interest to anglers as we have people from all over the country traveling here in the spring, winter, and, and fall to fish for these steelhead trout that return to the streams as adults. Early in the spring, these uh, jars up here would have eggs in them, and that's, that's where we first bring the eggs into the facility to grow and to hatch out. These tanks would all be full of water with, with larval young steelhead trout when they first come out of the hatching jars. So in addition to the steelhead trout, they do grow what we call catchable trout. So they're trout that we raise up to around 12 inches or bigger, and they get stocked in the small water bodies around the state for people to, to catch as soon as they're stocked. So these eggs will go to that rainbow trout production that will be stocked in water bodies all around Ohio. Here on Lake Erie, we're expecting an incredible 2023 fishing season. We have walleye catch rates that are higher than we've ever seen. Beyond that, we have some really good western basin yellow perch fishing. Yellow perch are really uh, favorite eating fish for a lot of people, and, and we have a, a good population and good fishing in the western basin right now. In addition to that, uh, smallmouth bass fishing will be great, and of course, all year long, you can find a place to catch these steelhead, either out on the lake in the summer, or in the tributaries in the cold months. Now, let's hear from an actual fishing, fishing enthusiast. As I mentioned earlier, we found Monica Lewis and her friends fishing on the Maumee River this past Friday. She was kind enough to chat with us for a while. Josh, let's play that interview. My name is Monica Lewis. I'm 53, born and raised right here in Toledo. How long have you been fishing? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All my life. <laughs> uh -huh. All my life, my mother and my uh, stepfather started me off fishing. My dad and my grandmother all fished. So mm -hmm. we've always come to the water. This is where I find my peace. Ah. You enjoy fishing. Do you enjoy the nature too? Do you love it? Your part oh, two. yes. I love nature anyway. I'm always outside. I'm an uh, outside person. Mm -hmm. uh, so I prefer to be, but the water is where I like to be. I prefer to fish than anything else. Mm -hmm. It's relaxing. Some people think that it takes too long because you just got to sit here. But that's the comfort in it, just sitting here, watching the water, watching your pose, nobody bothering you. It's totally quiet. The best thing ever. <laughs> so you don't fish, don't specifically fish for walleye? No, I fish for anything. Um, usually what we catch down here this time of year is white bass or white perch run through here. Walleye do run through here. Um, mostly I didn't caught today catfish. Um, I think a bass has been hitting me because I ain't been able to catch him. <laughs> <laughs> been teasing you kind of they kind of tease at you they mess with you <laughs> they don't hit like other fish do they kind of tease at it and run away come back tease at it again and run away so is this something you think kids should do will they like them 
Oh, most definitely. Yes. If you got kids at all, any kind of kids, uh, this would be something enjoyable for them. It's, it's, it's something enjoyable for the parent as well because it gets them out of their hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can Great. sit down and relax and your kids is fishing and you can watch them fish. You don't really have to fish with them. Just enjoy the weather with them. So do you think it's important to protect Maumee River, right? Right. Oh, most definitely. Absolutely. Most definitely. I don't leave trash down here. I try to make sure if I have line and stuff like that, don't leave it out in the water. Try to pull it in. Uh, don't leave your garbage and all that. Like, we got garbage down here. And, like, my pals ignore them. They go with me. But, like, the garbage that's all up here, all of that stuff, people should pick it up, clean it up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Take it with you when you go. There's garbage cans up at the top. Just go throw them in the garbage. It's a beautiful place. You know, it's a beautiful place to, to, to destroy it by adding harm to the water and killing the fish and slowly killing our economy, our, our econo system. That, I mean, that's the whole system. If you kill our fish, that kills other animals. It kills uh, our other wildlife, you know, uh, cats and dogs and other stuff eat this stuff. It's not just a matter of people. Everybody eats fish, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Every female eats fish. Thank you to Monica and her friends for talking with us. So, all our listeners, are you a fisherman? Perhaps you're not on the Miami, you are out on the Maumee River right now, fishing for all walleye. If so, give us a call, give us a call at, and let us know how the fish are biting. Now it's time to hear from our advertisers and pat patrons. Ecofill Shop. The Ecofill Shop is located 115 West Mary in Bowling Green, Ohio. I repeat, 115 Mary, West Mary in Bowling Green, Ohio. They sell lots of different things like cosmetics, bath and body, home and garden, cleaning, towels, knickknacks, candle, fragrances, and many more things. They sell all these things without plastic containers. That's the best thing. The whole purpose of Ecofill Shop is to eliminate plastic. Plastics take too much time to, to degrade uh, and are very harmful for our environment. Customers love them. Summer says, I'm loving the products they offer. It's sensible and affordable, all while being eco-friendly and plant-based, eliminating the unnecessary use of chemical. Now that's just one of the glowing testimonials you'll see at their website, ecofillshop.com. I am one of those customers. Before I came in this morning, I shaved using a shaving brush and my little bar soap of shaving soap I bought at the Ecofill shop. If you are interested, give them a call at 419-944-8862. I repeat, Ecofill shop 419-944-8862 and talk to the owner, Josie who's very passionate about their environmental issues, or you can check out their website, ecofillshop.com, or best yet, just drop, at, drop in at 115 West Mary in Bowling Green, Ohio. That's the Ecofill Shop. Now, Wood County Parks Park District. Uh, the Wood County Park District is a natural resources conversation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming and teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wild, wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. The Wood County Park, they protect natural uh, spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy. Uh, the Wood County projects, park projects are open from 8 a.m. to uh, 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year, that is 365 days a year. Uh, they can be contacted through uh, various means. They're, they have a website. Their website is www.wcparks.org. www.wcparks.org. You can call them at 419-353-1897. 419-353-1897 or you can follow them on WC Parks on all social, me social media platforms. WC Parks on all social media platforms. 
Okay, so now this show for a green future is also brought to you by our patrons. These are wonderful people who have gone to our patreon.com and searched for our Patreon page for a green culture, for a green future, for a green future. They looked at our different levels of patronage and chose a level that matched their monthly budget. And now they continued, their continued monthly subscription is a large part of how we can afford to keep this show on air and keep our efforts going on in this direction. Okay, thanks again to our advertisers and our patrons. Rebecca, that brings us to your part of the show. What do you have for us this week? Okay, well, this week, uh, a listener actually sent me in a, a sort of a short news story video. Uh, NBC did a, I think, a national, um, it was, I think it's on the national news. Uh, they, did a, they did a little short thing that mentioned Toledo. It was actually shot in Toledo about something called the Family Food Center, which I don't even know where that is. I probably have been by it, but I don't remember. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, apparently they're having some economic difficulty and a lot of other grocery stores or small groceries are going under uh, creating food deserts because the dollar stores are edging them out. Just They just take away just enough business, but then they don't really have the selection or the healthy food. You know, they tend to have a lot of processed food, which is not as healthy. Um, so apparently, uh, nationwide, there are $34,000 stores, <laughs> um, 35 which are in Toledo. <laughs> wow. um, yeah, and uh, this is all according to the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has done this study. And uh, locally, uh, a man named Donald Perryman, who does a lot of kind of, he's a minister, he does a lot of social activism as well, Is uh, has, has been having demonstrations sort of... Uh, you know, urging people to do something about this. Maybe the government even restrict the number of dollar stores that are allowed, which brings us to the subject of food deserts. Um, as Shabazz was saying earlier, it, it was talking about water. Well, the term desert is, is, it means a place where there's not enough water or it's hard to find water, which is essential to life. So the desert has been, been being used to mean any place where something really essential for yeah, healthy for humans to be survive and thrive is missing or very challenging to find. Um, Wikipedia defines it as an area of, that has limited access to affordable, nutritious food. Or as a rough metric, um, if you don't, if you live in the city and your grocery store is over a mile away or ten miles in the country, you're considered to live in a food desert. Although there are a lot of other factors that go into that, like okay, is the food affordable? Is the food actually nutritionally sound? Uh, do, what is transportation like in your area? Can you? How many people have cars, functioning cars? A lot of different things that can create a food desert, even if something is close, prevents people from having access. Yeah, I would, I would like to, uh, you know, like quickly add on, I would just like to quickly add on to it. Like uh, the, what you, what you talk about the, the, yeah, uh, connecting uh, or the networking uh, for the for the uh, you know transportation of food and you know all those things. It is also important that uh, you know supplying uh, food uh, also requires a good network, not only outside uh, of the country but also within the local communities itself, and that also becomes a problem when. Uh, there is scarcity of proper infrastructure. Now, mm -hmm. what happens is government, they, they, on the behest of providing you all these infrastructure and all that, uh, you know, they, they implement policies uh, which kind of harms the, the food producers in, in a great way. Yep. So, uh, many of the policies uh, which, which restrict farmers from doing many activities. So, the farmers, they kind of, they kind of uh, uh, face uh, they are kind of battered from both sides. Uh, the, 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 the ecosystem, the ecology is also battering the, the farmers at the same time, the, the policies also. So uh, uh, they, they, are, they are getting pounded from both sides, I must say. They, they, their daily lives become more challenging. And if you don't have thriving farms, you don't have food. That's yeah. a problem. That's mm -hmm. a problem for everybody, not just the farmers. Mm -hmm. um, it's a concern to me, of course, because I live in a food desert. To be blunt, <laughs> I just do. 
this is exacerbated by the fact that in Toledo, we do not have good public transportation. So effectively, uh, especially, you know, and, and of course, who lives in the city? Ethnic minorities live in the city, elderly people live in the city, and disabled people like myself live in the city. And, uh, you know, I'm restricted, for example, like there's a bus bus line that goes right past my house. Great. Okay. But there's no place to sit unless you walk a few blocks and I can't stand for very long. So that's a problem. Also, it only comes every other hour. So yeah, that's feeding it too. So, you know, what happens at my house if I need some ingredient? Oh, I ran out of garlic powder. I, you know, I, I need to fill the whole refrigerator, whatever. Um, well, we get rides, obviously. Sometimes I, I do my own bus trips to go get food and, and haul it home in, in a wheelie suitcase or something. Then the next day, <laughs> I'm sore and I can't do anything for a few days, which is bad because I need to be able to do things for us for our survival, really. Um, locally, you can walk down maybe, well, it takes me like a half hour because I hobble. I can hobble down to Bancroft Street, <laughs> 20 minutes away. There is a family dollar. Lately, it's been closed. I don't know what's going on with that. The remodeling it or something, or maybe, mm -hmm. we don't even know. Maybe it will be closed altogether. Um, also, there, okay, there's a, there's a bunch of little tiny convenience stores that have a lot of stuff that's horrible for you. If you're very lucky, you can find a package of bologna, maybe, or you can find, you know, something very, very expensive and bad for you that you can heat up in the microwave. <laughs> and we have a limited budget. You know, we, we get paid every month. So that could mean trouble for us later in the, in the, uh, in the month. Or, you know, if we, if we can't get to the grocery store in the time, you know, in the, towards the beginning of the month, our willpower breaks down and we order pizza. Because, you know, it's just, it's the beginning of the month, we're doing all our errands for the whole month in the first week, because that's how people who get paid every month live. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, okay, I just ran around paying our rent, going to the bank, paying our bills, trying to, you know, buy toilet paper mm -hmm. and garbage bags and coffee filters and things. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I can't stand up and cook dinner, too. You know, I can't do a grocery mm -hmm. stiff on top of that. And uh, so there's that, you know. To some extent, and, and this is a thing, um, apparently to some degree, community gardens and food banks do ameliorate, do, do lessen this problem. Um, so, you know, sometimes we get like a little, our, our local community garden food not bombs giving away free food thing. Um, we have one garden that's a few blocks away. It mostly seems to cater, like they have parties there that people who are involved with the organization go to and eat food. Other people could come. Some people from the community do come. You know, it's not really gonna put food on your table every day. And then during the pandemic, they did a really heroic job of like expanding their service and having delivery once, it was only once a week, but they were doing what they could, you know. And uh, then I think now they've cut back to just going to what the, the local needle exchange for, for addicts because addicts have a lot of trouble getting food and holding down jobs. You know, they're, they're busy. So, yeah, they, they, they do need this. So it's a resource, sort of, but because my roommate's involved once in a while, they'll send us home a plate. So we get that, you know. Um, mostly vegan food, not too bad, or, okay, there's Grace Community Center, which is right down the block from us. Uh, they appear to have some kind of a soup kitchen going on. I, 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 I know they have a, like a giant, really beautiful garden and they send people home because I walk my dog there and I have to fight her about uh, trying to eat the food people have dropped on the ground a lot. <laughs> and then like two blocks away, there's this little kind of a pocket park, you know, with just some swing sets, equipment, Behind that, there's a couple of abandoned houses. One of them has the door open, the back door open, and I'm always finding uh, like discarded food items, canned goods and things in the bushes. So mm -hmm. I think people who are living in there, there are some homeless people living there who like eat at the food kitchen, bring things home, you know, have the park as their dining room, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so, you know, that's not a bad thing to do. It's, it's, it's helping to some degree, uh, it's a complicated problem. It has to be attract, attacked from uh, multiple multiple angles. Um, also, we have a lot of fast food. You know, we end up eating McDonald's a lot. That's that's partly because my roommate has poor impulse control. 
<laughs> but it's also because that's what's available in our yeah. area. And that's a very interesting point you bring in because I have read some research which, which, which kind of talks about how the mass production of food is actually affecting the nutrients and the nutrition, nutritional value of the foods. Right. And also, you know, I think it will be really interesting if we, if we, you know, later in the future, down the line, we do some show on, you know, on how the GMOs and fertilizers and all those chemicals and, you know, uh, the alterations. How is it the commodification of food? mass production and commodification of food, how it is affecting. I think that will be a really interesting area to explore. You, you bring in lots of interesting stuff, I must say. It is a very big topic, yeah. yeah and there's also respect. They, they mentioned, uh, one of the articles mentioned that I read, uh, mentioned that a lot of the stores, you know, the, the, the customer service is bad, the store isn't clean, so people don't want to shop there. Um, I've had stores were you know they, they, they were just very authoritarian and approach you like you know you're a prisoner in their <laughs> store rather than a customer and are rude and mean so i won't go there or uh some of them are racist you know i've had to stop going to some stores where they were nice to mm. me but they weren't nice to some black some, people that oh. i knew so you know because they know they have you over a barrel you, mm. you can't go anyplace yeah, else yeah, yeah. you know you yeah. literally it's bad enough that um I have had, when I was living in subsidized housing, and I, I had a lot of my old friends that I came up with from the YWCA and all moved into the same place together, I had friends with full-time minimum wage jobs who would come begging me for canned goods when I was on welfare. Oh. But I had time to, to take a, like a four, four or five hour trip to the grocery store and bring, back, uh, bring, bring stuff back. <laughs> And they can't do that after they after they worked an eight hour shift, oh. you know. So it's it's that too, you know. It's a matter of convenience, which sounds yeah, oh convenience. That's nothing. No, no. It's yeah. really important when yeah. you when you especially these days people everybody has to work six jobs. It's terrible. You know? I agree. I agree. It's getting tougher day by day. I must say. <laughs> right. So apparently, three nine thirty nine point five million people, which is twelve point eight of the population of America live in low income areas, which tend to have poorer access to, to healthy food. Uh, apparently food desert, the term was coined in 1990 in Scotland by a resident of public housing. So just mm -hmm. an ordinary person mm -hmm. got uh, mentioned in an official document for the first time in 1995 by something called the low income project team of the, of the UK's United Kingdom's nutritional task force. So this is a British mm -hmm. thing. Um, they, they, they actually exist in both rural and urban areas, although I guess the causes are different. Mm -hmm. Um, there tend to be, like, it's more expensive to run a grocery store in the city because there's more crime you have to worry about. There are, are more ordinances, you know, higher taxes, everything. Uh... Yeah, according to a, a, a Karen Washington in a 2014 article in Guernica magazine, I don't know, <laughs> um, but she, she uses the term food apartheid. Oh. And uh, I don't know, you know, this is the thing I, I, I really have felt for a I, while. I mean, the, the term itself sounds so scary. It is scary. Yeah. <laughs> it's scary when you don't have food, believe yeah. me. Food or when you're looking for a job. Until, like, I, I feel like very strongly in Toledo, we use bad public transport hmm. effectually, effectively as a wall that you can't, you can't go beyond here. We, we don't want you here. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So it is apartheid. It's food yeah, apartheid. It's, so it's, all, it's employment apartheid. It's a lot of stuff without public. Like that's I, one of the reasons like, we get all this heat from the suburbs. Oh, no, we can't have public transit. We, we've got to cut back funding, and, and they're on the board of the TARDA thing. There's only one, I think there's like two people from Toledo on the board of the TARDA who live in Toledo. Uh -huh. That's our local transit system. So, I mean, that that's part of it. You know, also racial discrimination and income discrimination is, uh, it, it creates segregation that um, makes it easier for fast food companies to target low-income areas so it's a pretty serious problem and uh, really really has a lot of facets and, and has a real effect on people's lives mm -hmm. also global warming especially in other countries uh, is it's, it, Africa they're, they're studying this food deserts in Africa now and um, apparently like it's raising food price prices to the point where people just can't mm -hmm. low-income people can't afford mm -hmm. can't afford 
healthy food. So. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a very interesting comparison you bring in uh, because uh, uh, on, on one side, uh, we have food wastage problem here in all the global, no uh, global north or, or the modern western countries, but on the third world and other poor countries, there is extreme food shortage. I mean, right. at, 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 at a disastrous level. Oh my God. So, I mean, that was a great in, uh, information. Thank you so very much. But bad food is, is every bit as, you know, it, it will mess up your health. It, it, yeah. Like bad fatty food will mm -hmm. mess up your health every bit as much as having no food mm -hmm. <laughs> do. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, that is so true. Uh, thank you for this interesting information. Thank you once again, Rebecca. Uh, now, uh, as we uh, come closer to the end of the show, uh, let me quickly take you into the uh, realm of ecological news. First, let me begin with uh, some good news. We have been reporting about the evil corporation Holtex plan to dump radioactive water into the Hudson River and Plymouth Bay. Just last week, the company announced it was going to actually start dumping into the Hudson in May. Well, Holtec reversed itself this week after a universal outcry from citizens and politicians at the local, state and federal levels. A story of uh, Lohud.com, L-O-H-U-D, Lohud.com, entitled Indian Point Owner Holtec Pauses plan to discharge 1 million gallons, 1 million gallons of radioactive water, dated April 14th. Uh, in this uh, article, it describes uh, Holtex reversal. Even though the company backed off its plan to dump the water in May, it still maintains that it has the necessary federal, federal ap approvals to dump it at any time. According to a letter sent to the federal officials by the company, uh, the delay will give the company and federal regulatory officials time to ally public fears about the discharge, uh, the letter added. Sim uh, this seems uh, unlikely though, since a law is moving quickly through the New York State Legislature that would impose fines and penal penalties on any company dumping radiation of any kind into the Hudson. It is, it's important for us to note uh, in the Holtec radiation dumping controversies, uh, as well as the Japanese government's uh, plan uh, of dumping radioactive water in the Pacific, that these dumps are completely unnecessary. Tritium is the radioactive isotope which they are trying to dump of hydrogen that causes uh, the wastewater to be dangerous. Unlike some radioactive isotopes that are dangerous for thousands or even millions of years, tritium uh, has a half-life of only 12 years. That is much less as compared to other radioactive material. That is half of it decay, uh, decays into harmless helium gas over the course of 12 years. After 120 years, all of this uh, tritium uh, will be gone. It is one of the few kinds of radioactive waste that we do have the technology to deal with. All we have to do is put, in, uh, put it into tanks and monitor it for leaks for 100 years. That is what we can uh, and what we can and we should do. Dumping the tritium into our waterways while it is still dangerously radioactive is the worst possible method of disposal. Now moving on to some news from Europe. Europe is switching to renewables at a breakneck uh, pace. Uh, DW, the official German, uh, German news agency, released a report on April 8 uh, uh, entitled How Putin Made Europe Go Green Faster. It's available on YouTube. You can watch it on YouTube as well. DW has discovered that despite Putin's attempt at blackmailing Europe by cutting off their energy supplies, uh, the lights have stayed on. Europe's economy is growing and Europe's carbon emissions have actually decreased by 2.5% in the, in the year uh, 2022. The reason is simple. The European Union is switching to wind, solar and geothermal energy. In 2021, the European Union got 40% of its gas, fr uh, gas from uh, Russia and millions of tons of coal. Even though many coal plants were brought back online, they were barely used. Only 18% of their capacity was utilized. 
wind solar uh, wind and solar actually made up most of their uh, energy energy storage uh, coal was hardly used uh, they produced more power in 2022 than nuclear gas or coal uh, this record installations of uh, wind solar heat pumps and batteries uh, Heat pumps, uh, heat pumps in particular, more than doubled their installations in 2022. Now, coming back to our home, uh, home state, uh, that is Ohio, uh, our next story is about the development uh, from uh, the April 10th story of East Palestine contamination case. You will remember that back in uh, February 30. Uh, okay. Vividly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that was a great disaster. 38 Norfolk Southern uh, Southern train cars derailed, releasing many tons of pollution. The vinyl chloride was burned off, but the waterways were poisoned and the soil contaminated. We visited the crash site less than a week after the accident and documented that uh, there were still chemical odors in the air that caused the headaches and nausea you can you can uh, find all our reports on this uh, on our youtube channel for a green future our youtube channel and podcast for a green future well the problems continue with the cleanup of the wreck and its contamination on april 10 april 10th a truck carrying 40000 pounds of contaminated soil from the east palestine wrecked and overturned in unity township uh, just a few miles away from east palestine uh, the ohio epa has uh, uh, given their usual assurances that there was no danger from the contaminated soil soils and there's that, never any danger according to them yeah <laughs> they always say it. that in the <laughs> beginning even if if the the oil rigs uh, offshore oil rigs catch fire they, they, Basically. yeah they, they keep on saying that no danger bring your marshmallows yeah <laughs> I, I mean they even said that during the the iraq war, war when there was you know extensive oil spill even when the the bp oil spill uh, incident happened the initial statements always are somewhat similar kind of yeah <laughs> that I would, that I there's would depressing say. similarity there is yeah. <laughs> Uh, so they have given the assurance that there was no danger from the contaminated soils and that none of it had entered waterways and that the cleanup was proceeding normally. We, are, we here at For a Green Future show, we uh, tried to find out where the crash truck was headed. Uh, after exchanging emails with several government agencies and officials, uh, the only reply we got was the trucks were headed to Texas. That's it. We have no further information. There still remains over 17,000 uh, tons of soil on the site of the original der derailment, which needs to be removed. The current estimates are that uh, the total, uh, total cleanup will take over two years. The Justice Department filed suit against Norfolk Southern in the Western District of Ohio Federal Court on March 30th in order to recover uh, their expected cleanup costs. Uh, this suit uh, uh, accuses Norfolk uh, Southern of violating the Clean Water Act by unlawfully polluting the nation's waterways. Uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, thing that seems pretty obvious to us here at For a Green Future. Now, the fourth story is a very interesting story in uh, published in Commonwealth magazine dated April 13th and the title was Solar is causing a dramatic shift in energy demand. On Easter Sunday, it turns out that elect electricity demand in the New England power grid hit a record low. In New England, uh, unlike here in Ohio uh, and much of the rest of the country, Utility companies actually encourage and reward customers who install rooftop solar. Uh, as a result, more and more households are meeting their energy demands with their solar panels during the day and not needing any, not needing to take any power off the grid, uh, power from the grid. Uh, since the grid was established, uh, uh, electricity demand has historically been lowest at night. Uh, but for more and more often, but more and more often, the low point in demand happens when solar power 
is uh, generating most of the electricity. Cool. ISO New England reports uh, that uh, on Easter Sunday between 2 and 3 p.m. demand dropped uh, to only uh, 6,814 megawatts, the lowest uh, ever recorded. The previous records were the pr previous lowest record was uh, 7,580 megawatts. Uh, that was in May 1st, uh, 2021. That was also uh, Sunday and a bright sunny day. Lower demands means less demand for all polluting sources of energy, coal, nuclear, gas, or uh, other biofuels. Uh, so rooftop solar provides uh, a double benefit, meeting the needs of the homeowner while lowering the demand uh, on the grid. Coming back to our local city, Toledo. Toledo is one of the 18 cities in 14 states that will be part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration, that is NOAA. Uh, they are conducting a study of urban heat islands. Uh, they are, uh, here they will map local hotspots, uh, hotspots so that local decision makers can take steps to make their cities cooler. Heat is the number one cause of weather related deaths in the US for the past three decades. Areas with few trees and high levels of uh, concrete and as asphalt can be up to, uh, up to 20 degrees hotter than areas with more trees and less concrete. This 20 degrees can can be the difference between life and death for those vulnerable to to high heat, uh, such as senior uh, seniors and infants. Not to forget, uh, you know, maybe um, animals and other insects uh, in the ecology as well. And this program, oh, sorry. Our, our uh, uh, two summers ago was it one or two summers ago? Our uh, our air conditioner broke in the middle of a heat wave. Uh, a long heat wave and you know we had invitations to go places but we didn't want to leave our dog to die <laughs> effectively uh we can't get to the cooling center we would have to walk there it takes an hour we wouldn't make it <laughs> yeah. we don't have a car yeah. so but it's sort of it was one of those moments where you're like okay this might be how i die <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> god forbid that but uh, just yesterday, only my wife, you know, while driving, my wife uh, mentioned to me that uh, did we skip uh, uh, spring this year? Because it, it, it all of a sudden yeah. it feel, feels like somebody has turned on or flipped on the heater. <laughs> you know, it's it's so. It, it was a so. lovely half a day when you didn't have to have the heater or the air conditioner yeah, on. <laughs> yeah. So so I mean, see, this this is a very good example of what a twenty degrees. Right. Means like you Absolutely. know, Absolutely. yeah. So, so this program uh, of NOAA, uh, what they are doing is they are uh, using uh, volunteer citizens uh, and scientists to take the measurements. Sensors are mounted on bicycles or cars and ridden through the hottest parts of the city during heat waves. This program uh, was actually started in, uh, back in 2017, and it has so far helped more than uh, 70 different communities. So I think that will be a good uh, benefit for us as well. Uh, some of these strategies uh, communities can use to eliminate danger heat islands are, uh, is through planting trees, uh, public, uh, public transit shelters, that <laughs> air conditioning, uh, and developing heat emergency plans. Um, cities had to apply to participate in the study and successful uh, application uh, addressed environmental justice and uh, you know for a green future environment and justice and social justice is always our fourth theme and for our final story friends of earth have filled a, filed a lawsuit against pacific gas uh, and energy over their plan to uh, keep diablo canyon uh, nuclear plant open as we have reported before, Diablo Canyon, which is leaking uh, tritium and uh, which sits on an earthquake fault line in California, was scheduled to close last year. The planned, uh, the planned closure was part of a settlement agreed uh, to by all the stakeholders at that time, like the unions, company officials, uh, general public, nonprofit, uh, and other uh, stakeholders. Last year, at the uh, urging of Biden administration, Governor Newsom ignored that agreement and pushed uh, the law. So, FOI lawyers, 
so this was the show for today i hope you guys enjoyed it i personally enjoyed it a lot and i i greatly enjoyed talking to uh, rebecca and uh, a special shout out to all our patrons thank you so very much for keeping us going and uh, thank you uh, joe for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, any last words rebecca Adi. Everybody have a good week. <laughs> and Stay a cool. wonderful weekend. <laughs> yes. Enjoy fishing. Indeed. I don't want no oil to spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things. A free and crawling won't trade no more oil for blood the sun don't give us all we need to make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting and i do believe it's time we was done I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. No new